Hello, everyone here at the amazing CTN Live event. I'm Stephen Weiss, and I'm going to talk to you about VoiceOver today. So what I'm going to do is first bring up this wonderful PowerPoint presentation that I created just for you. Of course, what would Zoom and online learning be without PowerPoint presentations? <laughs> hello, hello, everyone in the chat. All right, I'm going to try to keep it so I can see the chat once I start sharing my screen. Uh, let me bring the slideshow up. Yes, right? PowerPoint. Woo! All right, so let's see. And now I can't see the chat. Let me move the chat over to my other monitor. There we go. All right, good. So I put, so I did put the chat in my other monitor, so I can see you and respond to you. Uh, feel free to ask questions, of course, but I'm going to save time at the end uh, for most questions. So while I'm presenting, I may not see uh, your questions in the chat, but otherwise, I'm going to try to do it. Hopefully, you can see the PowerPoint. Yes? We see it. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so there it is. Uh, so creating voiceover for animation. Now, this is something that's very interesting because a lot of animators that I've talked to, I've even talk, taught animators before, don't give a lot of thought to an, an, animation voiceover. And sometimes it's an afterthought. Oh, well, I guess we'll get voice actors now. But there's a whole lot to it that you may or may not know. And so I'm going to get into that for you today. So this is our overview of what we're going to talk about. So what makes a good animation voiceover? Well, it's more than just a voice actor, right? You've got to have a good director. Okay, some people think they can direct their voice actors on their own, and some people can, and some people can't, but probably you're not going to be able to do it as good as a director who's been doing this for 10 years, <laughs> for instance, right? So it, a good director makes a lot of difference. So we're going to talk about why. What else? Good acting, uh, obviously, but you're going to get good acting from uh, a good director and good writing, right? So you really have to have some good writing, and so I'm going to share uh, some tips on how to get a good script for your animation. Of course, things like audio quality when you record, but also post-production uh, and things that you also need. Like if you hire a bunch of random people on the internet, you don't know if they're gonna be timely with their delivery. You don't even know if they're gonna deliver anything uh, often, right? They can easily disappear or turn in something bad or not meeting specs, things like that. They may not be efficient. Uh, so if you have good voiceover, it's gonna be efficiently done. And of course, whoever you work with is going to have good lines of communication. All right, so the other thing is, uh, as an animator, you need to know what you need to bring to create your voiceover, all right? What stuff that you need. And so that's gonna be you bring to say a client or, or a studio that you're going to work with all the things that they're going to need from you, right? Rather than go, well, do you have this? Oh, no, we don't have this, right? So you want to have it ready when it first starts. What else? If you're an animator, what do you get, right? So after you, you give them your precious script uh, for your animation, what should you get in return, right? What are all the things that you should get if you hire professionals? And I'm going to tell you about that. Things not to do. And I'm going to give you an idea of how much this should actually cost. Okay, there is a lot of variation in cost, but of course you get what you pay for, as they say. And then I'll answer the non-union and union questions uh, and explain how that works a little bit. And then of course we'll wrap up and I'll be able to take questions. Now, you may be wondering, who is this guy? Hope you like purple, because this slide is purple. All right, so uh, I'm the CEO of my company, Marvelous Spiral Studios. Uh, and we do uh, production for uh, animation and video games. Uh, I started off as a voice actor. I've done quite a number of things, but a couple of notable things. I was in Helsing Ultimate, the anime. Uh, and I'm also Dietrich in Shadowverse. So if you actually play the Shadowverse, you can play as me. Uh, though I understand Dietrich isn't as popular as some of the other characters in Shadowverse. It's very sad, but there you go. But he is cool, right? And you guys know Dietrich? Uh, familiar with Dietrich from Shadowverse? All right, so, uh, all right, well, feel free to mention in the chat if you've played Shadowverse. Uh, I also directed, um, let's see, I directed a game for Sega, uh, and I produced a voiceover for anime called Kick Heart, right? So I've uh, been in voiceover for a while, and uh, my company provides uh, basically full services, right? So if you have an animation 
uh, or a video game that you need voices for. We do the whole production process and uh, we'll do the casting, the directing and the recording and then return to you the final files, all right? So if you're wondering who I am and why I'm talking about this, here you go, that's me and that's my company. All right, so here we go. Bad voice acting doesn't mean you has necessarily have bad actors, right? There's a lot of reasons your voiceover can end up low quality. Okay? And so we want to make sure that we eliminate all of these things. We want to eliminate bad writing, right? We want to eliminate bad casting, bad directing, bad recording, and bad posts. So bad writing can ruin everything, right? It's, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I knew someone was going to recognize Birdemic, right? Because Birdemic, that's what that picture is, by the way. Uh, Birdemic, I used, I showed to my film students because uh, it, it was the worst film I'd seen in every possible way. So the acting bad, the writing bad, the, the filming is bad, the editing is bad, right? And so it's a great example of how to do this wrong. You saw clips on YouTube, watch the whole thing. I, you will not regret it, I tell you. But, uh, but yeah, so it had all the bad things. But uh, you could have good actors and still if the writing is bad and the casting is bad, uh, like the girl who's in Birdemic, I actually think she's probably a good actress, but everything else was against her. The sound, the shooting, the angles. You know, there's one camera angle where they're shooting the back of her car seat as she's talking, and that's the scene. Right? So, uh, yes, it shouldn't make you mad. It should make you laugh because it's it's so wrong that it's, it's impossible to duplicate how wrong this movie is. Anyway, uh, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong and you wanna make sure you avoid all of these things because you can't just blame it on the actors when you have bad voiceover. So we're gonna look at how to avoid uh, <laughs> bad writing, bad casting and these other things, okay? All right, so this is a really, so I, I, you know, I thought of animators here because I know animators are taught character design, right? And some artists do character design, not everybody does. But one of the things about character designs is silhouettes, right? So you know that every character's silhouette should be so unique that you can identify that character by just seeing the silhouette, right? So your writing should be the same way. And I learned this the hard way. Uh, I wrote a screenplay, it's probably like 10 years ago now or so, uh, for a friend of mine that we were gonna make a movie together. And so I showed it to actually uh, a, an animation screenwriter. He wrote uh, some scripts for Marvel and um, I showed him my movie and he said, you can't, you can't tell the care. I can't tell who's talking. If I don't see the name there, they talk the same. Everybody talks the same. So that was a really important lesson for me to understand that the words that the choice of words, the cadence, the sentences, the punctuation, all that should be unique for your characters, right? So if you think your character is going to be identified on the screen by how they look and, and the backgrounds and stuff like that, but you got to remember that someone should be able to close their eyes, right? And still tell who the character is. So you should give them different ways of speaking, different vocabularies, different choices of words. But the big deal is if you're not really a, a pro writer or a seasoned writer, get someone, right? So you can write it yourself. I'm not saying don't write your script, right? Because a lot of you know indie animators are, I wanna write it and make it and all that, and that's cool, but you want somebody to polish it. You wanna bring in somebody and say, look, do my, are my characters unique and individual, right? Do they, do they use words that are different from each other? Do they speak in different cadences? Do they have different ways to talk? And so, if they do, then, then you're on the right path, right? But it's, it's really best to have good writing because this is the first point of failure, right? To have bad voiceover, the first point of failure is to have a bad script, right? And you might even, if you have good directors and actors, they'll probably say something like, I'm going to change this line. This line doesn't work, <laughs> right? So, uh, but you really should do that. But remember the actors, you, you, they can only do so much with what they're given. So you want to give them something good to work with. So they'll make you something amazing. All right, so that's part one, right? First point of failure script, make sure you have a good script, have, have an actual writer look over it. Even if you think you're the best writer, you gotta have another pair of eyes on this thing, right? You know, you're gonna, you're gonna miss stuff no matter what. All right, so somebody made a room reference. If you have seen the room, by the way, it is not as bad as Birdemic because everything is wrong with Birdemic. There's actually some okay stuff in the room that they did right. 
Uh, anyway, let's see. So directors. All right. Uh, a lot of a lot of animators are like, I'm going to go out on the web and do casting call and direct myself. But directors with experience are able to watch for things and able to do uh, do certain things that maybe would not occur to somebody who hasn't worked in voiceover, uh, you know. So one of the things directors do is they help the actors focus, but they bring out performances out of actors. There's a there's a magic skill that directors have, right? I don't know if you've ever seen like the the kind of uh, meme about it or or like you know the directors know what to say. They're just like act better, right? So they know the words to say to an actor to make them act better, to bring out the the better performance uh, from them, right? So that kind of that kind of skill is something you learn over over years of working with actor and of course it helps like me i was an actor first right so i i kind of know the language that i want to hear right and of course there is there's a whole language of voiceover right which i teach my voiceover students there's 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 things like throw it away and button it and billboard it and you know all these phrases that automatically mean talk this certain way and if you don't know it right you're not going to be able to convey that as easily to your actors Experienced directors know all the lingo. They know how to get what they want out of the actors. And the actors know this uh, lingo too, if they're, uh, you know, um, experienced. So one of the jobs of a director is to watch for consistent acting. So the enemy of the voice actor is something called drift. You all know what drift is. Anyone? Uh, you like, what, this is interactive? Yeah, I'm actually asking you questions. Anybody know what drift is in voiceover? Yeah, it's true. Okay, nope. Well, at least you're honest. Drift is uh, basically, let's say you've got a, a recording session. <laughs> Drifting cars, no. Uh, let, you know, this actually, uh, I'll, I'll use my example for Shadowverse. I was, uh, you know, when I went in to record for Dietrich, um, at the beginning, I, I said my line a certain way, you know, whatever the first line was. And uh, then I did 50, 60 lines for the character. And then at the end, they took my last line and played it and then they went back and played my first line to see if I sounded like the same character. Now, fortunately, yes, yes, Sarah, you got it, right? So I sounded like the same character. I didn't have to re-record my lines, but drift is terrible because what if you've got 500 lines and slowly, slowly over time, the character has changed, right? They've started using a slightly lower pitch. They've started using a different cadence for their words. Right. And so the director is going to be watching out for drift because drift is a big thing. Right. Yeah. And so you don't want to uh, have to re-record half your lines because you drifted. And then you're like, well, what part do you like? Do you like how I did it first better or how I did it later? Right. So uh, directors watch for drift. And of course, professional actors are, are aware of, of drift, too. Right. So they know what drift is. But you, that's one of the director's main jobs is to watch out for drift. So they're going to correct that and keep it from happening. Whereas somebody who's not as experienced as a director might end up recording 100, 200 lines and then later on. And they won't know it because it's subtle. Right. It's a tiny little drift. You know, imagine you're going down a stream and it slowly moves you toward the shore or whatever. But uh after a while, a tiny little amount after 100, 200, 300 lines, you've gone pretty far. Uh, but you didn't realize it because it was very subtle. And now you're ready to put the animation into the, the, I mean, the voices into the animation. You've already paid the voice actor, the session's over. And then you realize they don't sound the same in scene 21 as they did in scene one. And so what are you going to do, right? So directors watch out for drift. Um, they'll, directors are wary to correct dialogue. So uh, if there's a sentence that doesn't make sense, they're just like, okay, I'm going to just rewrite this real quick to make sense, uh, you know, fixing grammar, punctuation, or things like that. Uh, they're also on top of pronunciation to make sure that you say the same word the same way every time. They're very organized because they know what they're doing, right? They've directed before because when you're directing, you're doing several things at once. You're listening to the audio quality. Uh, and that there's that's just the technical quality. You're listening to the technical quality, make sure there's no uh, pops. Make sure there's no clicks. Make sure there's no background sound. Director's listening for that. Director's also listening for performance at the same time. Is it the performance I want? So they're doing that. They're also looking ahead to the next line, right? And thinking about that, right? And so it, all that stuff is happening at the same time when you're directing. And if you're not experienced, you're, you might miss one of those things, right? Um, and so uh, another thing that happens in the studio is you've got an engineer 
who is used to working with directors and the engineer knows exactly what the director wants whenever they ask, okay, I want you to keep take two, boom. They'll move take two to the keeper track, right? They'll mark it. And then when you're done, you'll get an export track of all the keepers. And then you'll, you'll have, here's another thing, is directors and engineers know that you need to save the whole session when you do voiceover, right? So even if you do multiple takes, you're gonna mark takes as the keeper, but you're also gonna save the whole track in case the keeper track has a problem, right? So you don't have to bring the actor back in. Okay, so it's a really important thing uh, that you need to do. And of course, uh, experienced director knows what to happen when, what to do when something unexpected happens, right? So I had somebody come in uh, that I cast and they, this is really funny. Uh, and, and it's not something you think about very often, but you know, now that I've, I've learned it, I won't forget. But there was a character in the video game I was doing, the Sega game, well, talk like this, right? They have this kind of voice. Apparently, it's really hard to talk like that for two hours. Uh, so we had an actor <laughs> come in, and after 15 minutes, their voice wouldn't do that anymore. And so we had a, you know, we had a tight schedule. We had a delivery date and all that kind of stuff. And so what I did is I knew that one of my other actors coming in later that day was able to do something like that. And so we ended the session with that actor. I called up the other actor. I'm like, all right, we're going to throw you some more lines. You're going to do this other voice, blah, blah, blah. And we covered it in the same day. Right. And so there was no delay to the client. Right. And to the client, there was it didn't they didn't even know that happened. It didn't matter because they still got a good performance. They got what they want. So that's a kind of contingency that can happen. Right. So a lot of things like that you need to do. And, and actually, you know, uh, as it's nice to be a voice actor that directs, because if somebody does mess something up, it's possible that I can go in and do the lines. <laughs> right. You know, if it's something close to what I can do, I'm like, OK, I'm just going to go do this, you know, uh, and, and make sure it's covered. Right. So having an experienced director, you know, saves you a lot of things. and It really does help uh, because you may miss some stuff if you try to do it yourself. Talented, experienced actors. OK, so there's that that enemy of drift, right? Uh, so we see that keeping consistent characters. Uh, voice actors know about drift and they try to prevent it, right? Uh, one of the things to do, uh, for instance, uh, if you play MMOs, I'm a character in Blade and Soul, right? Uh, which is a very beautiful MMO. <laughs> Everything, everyone is beautiful. Everything is beautiful in, in Blade and Soul. Um, and so I play a recurring character named Chun Doom. And uh, so when you, uh, when you, when I was in the booth recording for you know, it was a recurring character, right? So I would leave for a few months, they would release an expansion. And so then I would come in and then be Chundun again. And so at the beginning of the session, they would play me a sample of me from the time before. Uh, but every so often, you know, every 15, 20 minutes, the, uh, the engineer would play me the sample again, right? Not, she wasn't trying to say I was drifting. It was just in case, right? You know, so like, here's you again, just in case, this is how you're supposed to sound, you know, this is what you sounded like in the other expansion. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what you uh, need to do, right? Uh, and, and experienced voice actors are, uh, you know, they know about drift, but the big thing is too, is they work, work really fast because most of us are used to having to work within a budget and uh, being careful uh, about not wasting time. Now, this is different now, sort of, because a lot of stuff has shifted to home recording. Uh, so you're not necessarily in a studio, right? Um, recently, uh, I actually moved my entire voiceover business to North Carolina, and I have a studio here, and I have a home studio, uh, and I have uh, actors here. And so, well, you know, we're still able to go into studios here. Uh, and I think LA, there's a little bit you can go in that they're, you know, they've got a lot of restrictions. Uh, either way, though, uh, you know, if you have someone experienced, uh, they're going to be able to work faster and more efficiently. But also the danger of hiring random people off the internet, right? Uh, I don't know if you've heard, you know, there, and I'm talking about these vo these websites like Voices One Two Three and stuff like that, which is nothing wrong with them. But you know, you're you're not going through an agency or a studio or a director that you know. You're just picking random people, and they could uh, be like, go and tell all their friends on Facebook, right? Immediately, I got hired to be in this thing, and it's supposed to be secret, right? It's supposed to be non-disclosure, and they just go out and tell everybody because they're not professionals. They're just random people on the internet, you know, so that can happen, right? Um, and, uh, and then you also have to realize that 
uh, sometimes that uh, some of the work is vocally stressful, uh, but professionals understand how that works, right? Sometimes there's extra pay for that, but that's that is just a footnote, really. The important thing is uh, vocally stressful work is uh, experienced voice actors know to, to do it at the end, right? So if I've got uh, 150 lines to record, but in the middle of it, there's a fight, then what I'm going to do is save the fighting for the end where I'm going, Rah! you know, or whatever, when I'm doing all that stuff that, that, you know, it's going to strain your voice no matter what, even if you're really good at not straining, you know, just the fight efforts and everything tends to, to be that way, right? Okay, <clears throat> so you want experienced actors. I want to get more to the meat of things here. So here we go. <clears throat> you're an animator, right? And you're making your own animation, let's say, okay? So what do you want to do? Well, you want to hire, <clears throat> let's say you want to hire a, a small company to do your voiceover for you, right? So what do you need to bring? Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you. Of course, you need the script. Now, what I prefer is an Excel spreadsheet, and I'll, I'll show you an example of this in a little bit, but the reason is, is we can filter by character that way, right? If we, if we drop it into a table, and then each character gets filtered separately, the hardest thing to do uh, to record is like a movie script, which is what honestly most people write it in first, right? They'll break out final draft or movie magic or something like that. And they'll write it in screenplay form, which is fine for making the animation from, right? Cause it's got scene descriptions and all that, but we don't need that right for voiceover. I don't need this, the long half page description of them walking into the room or what's in the room, right? It's totally irrelevant. Well, maybe not totally. There might be some flavor there, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it's good if you take all the voice and you put it into an Excel for us. So we love that, <laughs> right? So if you are bringing in people to do your voice, then it's nice to have it in Excel. But what, what we need is uh, the script and then a story synopsis where uh, we have, an, you know, especially as a director, right? I want to know what's happening and why and things like that, right? Of course, we want to know the estimated number of lines. So that's going to tell us how much studio time it's going to take or uh, you know, if it's home recording, how, how much home recording time it's gonna take, right? And so by the way, usually what we're doing now for professional home recording is I did this uh, the other day, I worked with Kirk Thornton and uh, directed him from home. And so I just connected to his home studio and uh, you know, his, his voice came out through my speakers and I listened and it just directed kind of like I was in the booth. And if I didn't, if I needed him to do another line over, I was like, okay, Kirk, you know, can you do this over again? And so he did that. And um, so it, it's still basically the same thing, except it's remote, right? Uh, but we won't need to know the, about the number of lines right, uh, right away. It, you know, that helps us, right? Instead of having to go through your entire, entire script and try to figure it out ourselves, if you give us right off number of lines, especially per character, that's even better because then I know exactly how much time each character is going to take. Well, approximately, right? Um, and then we're going to make for you, we're going to cast, right? So assuming we're going to cast, then we need like a bio for each character and a picture. Now, some minor characters, we don't need a picture for or whatever, right? But main characters you do. By the way, um, what, what the standard is usually for casting for animation and games and stuff like that is, is that the casting of the main characters is a collaboration process, right? So what, what I would do is I take the bio and the picture, and I'll show you an example of this later, uh, and then get some auditions and I'll take like the three or four best ones, right? So that saves you time. You don't have to listen to all the awful ones I get. Well, you know, not always awful, but ones that just don't fit. You're like, eh, that's not really what we're looking for, right? So I'll send like usually the top three to the client. Now you, you can request whatever you want if you're hiring me, right? But that's usually what's done. So then you pick your favorite from the top three, right? For the main characters. Then we usually cast everybody else for you, all the minor characters uh, ourselves and, you know, from the people that we want. But of course, if you wanted to cast everybody, it's your, it's your animation. So you could get in on that too, right? But we do that, and then um, so that's how we make our casting notices with the bio and the picture. If you do have any animation already made, I mean, normally, obviously, uh, with original animation, you get the voices first and you animate to the voices, right? Uh, but uh, in most cases, anyway. But if you do have something to show, it's always nice to show the actors to give them a feel uh, for what's going on. And of course, if you created your own planets, countries, uh, magic items, or whatever that have pronunciations, you've made up some words, you have to tell us how to pronounce these words so everybody does them the same. Um, it's funny, I don't know, I imagine a number of you are anime fans. And so you've probably noticed that, you know, it doesn't happen as much now, but earlier dubs, 
uh, characters would not have con consistent pronunciation of weird names for things, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, that's, that's something you want to make sure you send a guide for. Uh, because a lot of times, uh, I know what happened, too, with those anime, depending on the studio, but um, usually what happens is they're on a super tight deadline, and then it's, you know, four in the morning in Japan when they're recording, so they can't call Japan, so they're just like, ah, just say this, you know, and we've got to get this dub out. Uh, so that's what, you know, happens. But uh, now it's it's more streamlined and, you know, usually there's a pronunciation guide set for everything. All right. And now the big uh, another big thing is efforts. We're going to talk about those in more detail. And then, of course, you need to know what you want before you hire uh, the voiceover people. Right. You know, just, oh, I don't know. Just show me what you got. Have a good idea what you want so we can give it to you. All right. All right. Good. So here's a sample of a script. Uh, basically that I stole from the internet, which was a sample script, so it's okay. Um, basically, you can see there's going to be some kind of sequence number or cue number, right? Uh, just depending on what it is. There'll be some kind of basically primary key or unique identifier, so you know which line it is without having to say, it's this character's 12th line or something like that, right? And so uh, you've got your idea where it goes. And so then it, you've got a list of all the characters. Now, of course, you have to spell their name correctly every time, because then if I want to filter with Excel, it's going to filter that out. And then I can just see the lines for one character, because in America, how we record our voiceover for animation, usually 90 some percent of the time is one actor at a time. Right. I don't know have, if any of you have like watched how they do anime in Japan. They'll have multiple actors like the leads in the studio together. Right. But we don't do that. Uh, we just do one at a time. So I'll use the filter on Excel to just filter out that one character's lines. Now, we want the whole script, though, because sometimes we want context. Right. Especially the actor be like, well, what am I responding to here? And then I can just pop off the filter, see what the other character says, show it to the actor, then pop the filter back on. So they only see their lines. This is why we want our scripts in Excel. Right. We're like, oh, please. <laughs> oh, please. Uh, show it. Is there an export? Okay, this is good. Export option with final draft to get this Excel doc version. Do people just copy and paste? Man, I've never tried to export it from final draft. Um, the, I think there is a way in final draft to only export dialogue though, right? So if you only export dialogue, um, wait, am I supposed to click some? I've never done this Q&A before. I've been using Zoom for a year now. Let's see if I click answer live. Okay, I, I guess I answered it, but uh, there you go. Yeah, so I, I don't know, I, you know, look it up, but I at least you can export to, I think you can export the dialogue separately. And then that will give you a leg up on it, right? Because, I mean, it is kind of a pain to have to go um, and delete out all of the um, descriptions and action lines and all that kind of stuff, sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, look in there for a final draft and see if you can export just dialogue because that's going to give you an advance advantage on that. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you see the line, and then there'll be a direction. Now, sometimes there's nothing in the direction. Uh, oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that comment. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's uh, a lot of um, possibilities for direction, but a lot of times it's blank and just leave it open to the director. But this is something you write, right? This field, it either will say direction or notes or something like that. But you write this in the script as the animator or the, the script writer to tell, okay, this character, right? For example, this character's drunk right now. But they're not always going to be drunk, right? Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what your show's about. But uh, if they're drunk for a few pages, then you just you know, put a note in that says they're drunk, they're drunk, they're drunk, they're drunk, and then no longer drunk, right? And so the, the actor knows, oh, I'm drunk. I'm drunk right now, you know, and then they're not drunk. Um, so you can, uh, so the, you know, the actor knows and the director doesn't have to worry about trying to figure that out, right? You help them out uh, by telling them things or, you know, things that are whispered or, uh, you know, any kind of direction like that. Go ahead and put that as, you know, there's, a, there's usually a field called direction or notes or something like that, right? Which is notes to directors and or actors uh, for these uh, scenes, right? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, and so let's see, moving on. So this is a big thing that people forget. Um, and uh, it's super important, right? Imagine you've made your animation and you wrote out all the script lines and everything, but it's kind of action. They're running around, they're jumping, and you, you've hired your actors and they recorded all your lines. And then you realize, 
that there's no sound for them jumping and punching and lifting and, and all the, the, the sounds, the effort sounds that they make. And so there's kind of two ways you can do it. Um, you can go through your script and look whenever that's, they do something that would require a sound, you write down, okay, uh, you know, and, and laughing is a big one too, right? There's laughter a lot. So-and-so laughs and you don't write laughs in the dialogue most of the time, right? You say, you know, like, uh, you know, Jackie and Jason laugh heartily or something. And that's in the, in the description, right? That's in the action, uh, not the dialogue. So you gotta make sure that you have that. But you could also just give a list at the at the end of the actor session and say, all right, jump, you know, do a small jump, do a big jump, do a small punch, do a big punch, <laughs> do a, la a short laugh, do a long laugh, you know, stuff like that. And then you just have it all in case later you're like, oh, I needed a, a sound there, right? You know, um, out of breath. Uh, and of course, video mostly video games are the getting killed sounds, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't normally hear the getting killed sounds uh, and it, well, it depends. I mean, my first anime was, was Helsing Ultimate. And actually I played like, we, we were doing what's called incidentals, which is like one line characters. And uh, so we did uh, uh, like 30 people who died uh, in that session, right? Yes. Yes, I tried to make my uh, slides appropriate for the subject. Um, so yeah, any of the, anything, any vocalizations that you make that aren't uh, words, right? You wanna make sure you get the actor to do those. Uh, and so uh, make sure you know what they are before you bring in and hire the voice talent, right? <laughs> before, because <laughs> you don't want to realize you needed it later. You didn't have it. Okay. I mean, there is, you can do pickups. You can hire the actor again and stuff like that. It's inefficient, right? And it could cost more because now you got to pay their hourly minimum just to bring them in to make a bunch of grunts for two minutes, you know? Uh, so it's better to just get the grunts at the end and not pay them any more for it and have them ahead of time. All right, so here we go. Here's my fun example of uh, an audition sheet, right? So uh, basically um, <clears throat> what you do is you get the character picture if you have it, right? Uh, my gosh, no, no voice actor. I got a question in the chat if, if anyone's embarrassed to do the sound effects. No, everyone loves this part. It's the most fun part to do, right? I mean, it is, <laughs> everybody loves to go in and grunt. I'll tell you what, I did a kid's animation uh, recently. I was. Uh, the voice of a um, a wolf in this kid's movie called The Return. And uh, and so I did all the wolf lines, you know, wolf is the bad guy, of course, stereotyping, poor wolf. But uh, at the end, there is the big fight between the wolves and, it's, and their oryxes are the good guys, right? So you've got the oryxes and the wolves. And so they had me in there and then they had another voice actor and they literally brought just people from the office, right? Other... <laughs> like office workers. And so there was like five of us in there and, and the director's like, all right, everybody, you're going to bark and howl. <laughs> right. So we're just, oh, you want me to demonstrate barking and howling? Uh, so we're all in there, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, how does a wolf bark? I don't know. We just bark like dogs. And we're like, I don't know how it's different. Uh, but, you know, and I wish I could, I mean, it'd be, it's much more, it was much more cool if you had like five of us at the same time, because we're all just like, you know, <laughs> right, whatever, to our, the best we could, barking and howling and, 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 and snarling, <laughs> you know, and there's a whole room of grown, grown adults barking and snarling and yowling and getting paid for it, which I thought was the funny part. So no, uh, no one's embarrassed. We love to do that stuff. Uh, I think, act, you know, it's hard to embarrass an actor, really. I mean, come on. Uh, but anyway, that was a good, <laughs> good question. Yeah. Uh, but so, uh, so this is an audition seat, right? So you would send like the, the, the voiceover producer uh, a picture and then a bio, right? So you can see under the bio there, of course, I didn't get to do, you know, I didn't cast Donatello for anything. Uh, but anyway, um, the uh, uh, description of the character, it, age is really important because that just, deter you know, that's what the voice sounds like in terms of age. It doesn't mean that the actor has to be that age, right? I mean, like, if you watch Naruto, uh, you know, at some point, all of the main characters were voiced by people over 30. And of course, they're all teenagers. So, uh, you know, and I have a teenager voice that I use for things, uh, you know, which I used in Citizens of Space. And, um, but, uh, you know, so you give them an age range of what the character is supposed to sound like, right? Uh, and then you uh, talk about the, the, the kind of personality of the character. Okay, and just a short bio, but they want a personality that gives an idea of how the character will talk, right? And so what you want to see is, um, 
enough detail so they get the idea, but you don't want to write a book either, right? A nice paragraph is good, something to, you know, this is a little tongue in cheek, right? He is a ninja and also a turtle, right? I mean, that's just me being dorky, but, you know, just a description of that in there, right? And uh, so, and then, and then you can give what's called a voice reference. Now, this is not an impression, right? Now, this is another example that professional actors will know what this means but you know, amateurs will not. Amateurs will try to imitate that voice. But a voice reference means something in this category, right? So if I say sound like Tom Holland in Spider-Man Homecoming, it doesn't mean do an impression of him. It means your voice should be kind of youthful, uh, maybe a little bit insecure, unsure of themselves, you know, the, the way he talks. And so that's, that's what a voice reference means. So we don't need voice references, but they're very handy if you have one, if you have an idea of somebody that you want them to sound the same category as, right? Um, okay, and then after that, the copy is a few lines. Now, uh, the copy could be lines from the actual animation or just lines you made up for the audition because you want, really want to hear them angry, sad, happy. You know, you want to give a, a variety or you just know what you, you want them to hear them saying as the character, right? So the copy is usually, it's usually more lines than two, right? It's, I like to do about five, right? If I hear five lines of like varying emotions, uh, you know, then I have a pretty good idea of what that character is going to be. Um, you know, you don't send them a book, you know. Uh, one thing I don't like as an actor is when they send you an audition and they want you to do like 40 lines, right? Because I know that you're not going to listen to all of it anyway. You're going to decide after like five or six lines whether to keep listening or not. And then if you do like it, you might listen to 10, but okay, I don't think you're going to listen to the whole audition. So uh, it's best to keep your copy down to about five to 10 lines, I would say for that, okay? All right, good. So let's see. Um, Moving on, other things that you want to think about when you're doing the script, right? So um, you uh, make sure that you write down any special names for things, explain what they mean, and give a pronunciation for them, okay, which we talked about. Uh, you, you want to make sure you know what the format's going to be ahead of time. You tell your, your voice person, okay, I'm going to send you an Excel or I'm gonna send you this, I'm gonna send you that, right? So, uh, by the way, Max, that's really tough to do. Um, it, I would not, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get some really good improv actors there. Uh, if you're going to uh, have an improv audition where they answer in character. So the actors that are really good at improv are gonna do well, uh, but you might miss some really good actors who are terrible at improv, but really good at reading <laughs> characters, right? So it, it's a fun exercise to do, but you might miss some really good people that way. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So it's like, oh, okay, that's an interesting idea. Um, but let's see. So we agree on the format. And then another thing is, you know, before you send the script, check it, right, for mistakes and uh, duplicate lines or mislabeled. Because if we see anything that we really have no idea what to do with, then we're going to have to stop recording and call you and be like, what, what is this? <laughs> right? What is happening here? Explain this. And then you might not know either. And then you've got to figure it out. Right. So it's really best that you do good once over on your script uh, before you send it along to be recorded. Right. Before you give it to your director or whatever. Yeah. All right. Good. So. All right, once you give all those things to the uh, company or whoever you hire, right? And then uh, what you need to do, uh, hopefully, is get all of this back, right? So you're gonna re request, usually it's WAVE, right? And so those of you who are audio people know that WAVE is uncompressed, right? So it's lossless. I mean, there's also FLAC and some other things, but the standard is WAVE. Most people use WAVE files, right? And so um, the, and I see your question, I'll get to it in a second. So WAVE is a standard file. Usually that's what you're gonna get, right? And if you also are an audio person, you know that MP3s uh, are compressed. Not only that, they strip off the really high frequencies and the really low frequencies. They're sort of outside of human hearing anyway, but professionals like, don't want it to be compressed or stripped, stripped. So they will just use WAVEs for that, okay? Um, let's see, so, uh, but you should have told them, right, uh, also how you want the files, right? So before you get them, you should say, all right, here, this is the format I want. 
And this is the naming convention. So the naming convention is the standard for naming, right? Any, whatever way you, you know, like those sequence numbers I, gave, I showed you before, right? Whatever way you decide, you have to have a way for them to name them, right? And so you can do it by scene. You know, you could do something like scene, character, number, right? You know, so scene one, Jeffrey 13. And so that's his 13th line in scene one, right? For Jeffrey. And then, you know, as long as you know how to plug them back in when you get them, because you're going to get them all as separate files, right? Um, only in dubbing do you get one big file that's already synced, <laughs> right? But if it's original animation, the idea is you're going to animate to the voice acting, right? So uh, they don't give it to you in a timed, you know, one file. It's chopped up in individual slices. So you want to make sure that you have some kind of naming convention that makes sense to you so you know then how to plug it back into your animation, okay? Um, what you will also receive, <clears throat> which is what a good director will do and a good actor, and I guarantee if you hire random people from the internet, they won't give you this. Uh, they will give you notes. We changed this line, right? Or I did two takes for this one because I wasn't sure how you wanted me to pronounce this word or whatever, right? So you get notes back uh, that will tell you any changes that were made so you can review them, right? Or so you know what happened or whatever. I mean, because every once in a while it gets through and you just have a sentence, it doesn't make sense. And so, and if we can't get a hold of you or whatever, we'll just record it a few different ways that we hope one of them is the right way. <laughs> right? And so then we'll send you a note and we'll say this line, you know, scene five, Jason, line 16, uh, we recorded three different takes for this line, blah, blah, blah. So you, you know, look, and those are, and these files are labeled take A, take B, take C, et cetera, right? Uh, and you also should uh, either you'll get it or they'll save the entire session for you. So they'll save the takes that were not used or not selected, but they're going to pick the takes. Usually the director is going to make every actor do two takes. That's kind of the standard. And they say which one is the best. They'll pick the best one. Then you'll keep that. Uh, but you'll get a, uh, somebody should save the director, or the actor, depending on how you're recording remotely or in the studio. Uh, you'll get they'll They'll save all the files. So then if you have a problem with the take later, you can contact them and say, hey, this take has a problem. Do you have another one? And they'll have the other one from the actor. Uh, you know, that's what a professional will do, right? If you just get, you know, a random person on the internet, they'll just deliver you the lines. They might do one take each and then something's messed up. Then you, they got to do it over. They don't have the whole session for you. All right. And then post, you know, uh, you can get post done. Usually, you know, anytime I've worked in a studio on a video game or an animation, right, we do at least normalization at the end, at the very least, to make the volume of all the, uh, voice is the same, so it sounds consistent, right? And then we can do simple things like compression and things like that too, if you want it. But um, the important thing is, is you'll get them that way so you don't have to do it. Now, of course, if you want a bunch of effects and stuff like that, that's really an audio effects house that does that kind of thing. But, you know, uh, like my company, we do, we can do simple things like, oh, this character should be a robot. Like I can throw a robot filter on, you know, a character, that's not hard to do. Uh, right. So, um, but if anything, you know, super advanced or tricky, then you would send it off to a different, like an audio effects place. But we do post, right? So you get post, you get normalization, and it'll be consistent. This is the big thing about using a studio. If you use a, a studio and all your actors come to the same studio, the sound quality will be all exactly the same. Right. You don't have to worry about the characters sounding like they're in different places or whatever. Go back to Birdemic, those of you who saw Birdemic. There's a restaurant scene right near the beginning where the two main characters go in and they eat at a restaurant and they're literally in the same building. But because the camera coloring and the audio, the room tone is different for each cut when he shows the guy and shows the girl, it looks like they're in two different places. They are in the same place, but because the camera's coloring is different and because the background sound is different, the room tone, uh, it feels like they're not even in the same place together, right? And though that can happen with your audio if you have a slightly different mic quality and you know just slightly different uh dynamic range on the bass or the treble of the voice you know it can be different if you hire a bunch of random people on the internet with different microphones you're going to have inconsistency in your audio you might be able to clean it up a little bit but then that's extra work too right so if you hire one studio to do all of it and they record in the same place then you're going to have consistent audio for it too right so if you really want to have that pro level audio that's what you're going to do uh let's see the question uh, some shows require a lot of screaming and yelling. Have I had artists who couldn't do a scream yell? No, uh, not that, but sometimes we'll just, they'll get uh, burned out for the day. 
Uh, and so what we do is instead, uh, we say, just come back and you can do the screaming next session, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe it's their last session and it's rough, but usually they'll either just fight it out then or uh, they'll, uh, that we will bring them in another day and just save it for then. Uh, let's see, so I got a question from, from Case there. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna click answer line. Could you share an instance or two of great directing that has improved or complicated your performance? Ooh, that's two different things. And do you have any go-to directing methods for actors I work with? All right, sure. Uh, that is about four questions, but I'll try to, to, to get it all. Um, so, uh, du you know, directing is, um, let me think of, of being directed. One of the things that I did, uh, I came in for Ace Combat 7. And um, yeah, right, yeah, don't use lots of different mics. Uh, I came in for Ace Combat 7 to be one of the fighter pilots for that game. And so uh, what happened is um, I uh, came in and the, the director's like, all right, you know, what are you gonna do? Here's your voice. He's like, all right, well, what I want you to do is just, first I want you to tell me what you had for lunch today in your normal voice. And so he, he just had me go through and talk in my normal voice for a while and kind of it, it, almost like a warm up, but also to get to get the voice quality of my normal voice. And then we're going to go from there. So, you know, I think that was that uh, helped me uh, a lot. Uh, another thing that really helped a lot is uh, I did a kid's movie, another kid's movie called Ella Bella Bingo. Now, this was a, a, a SAG higher budget production. It's so different than anime. Anime is like two takes and you're done. They don't even care if it's bad at that point because they're so tight on the budget, right? They're just, they, you, you just have to get in and out of there. And that's why they keep hiring the same voice actors over and over and over again, which is why I've only done it like three times or whatever. But because um, they keep hiring the same people I know because they're fast and they want people who can do it fast. And so it's fast, fast, fast. But then, then I went in for this uh, kid's movie, Ella Bella Bingo. And we, as a former Disney director and... Uh, <laughs> I don't think dubs are bad. I think they're actually really good now uh, compared to what they were like 20 years ago. Uh, but um, anyway, I don't, I'll get into that later or not. Uh, but the, the thing, the thing that, that the director did is just let, let me work with the voice. And he said, don't worry about the lip flap because as a dub person, you know, cause I do dubs. Uh, I'm actually pretty good at it by the way. Uh, but uh, sorry, in case any, anyone was out there. Um, but the, uh, the director said, don't worry about matching lip flap. Just give me a performance. Give me a performance. Get the, get the feel. Right? Got the feel first and then match the lip flap. It was so much better. It was so smooth. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, with the anime and stuff like that, there's no time. There's just a budget, you know, the crunch in there. You're, you got to get in and out. So you don't have time to develop that kind of thing. You just got to, you know, and they, and they really, really want you to um, hit those uh, lip flaps, you know, because audiences are so picky about that. They don't like it when the, the voice doesn't match. And so it's a very difficult skill. Uh, and so um, let's see. So we're getting getting a little more questions than I can deal with right now, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'm going to get through the rest of the presentation first. Okay. Um, so yeah. And what I do, you know, for directing is um, uh, a, a lot of times um, you just give them, you just give them a little push in the right direction. All right. A little bit matter a little bit softer, a little bit, you don't give them more than one direction at a time. If you try to tell a person to do two things, that's gonna be difficult. You know, some people can do it no problem, but I try not to. So when I direct, I just shift them one direction at a time. There's that, okay, now I've got that. Let's shift them now here. Okay, now it's here. Uh, now we're gonna go here. Okay, so uh, let's see. And so in terms of microphones, there's a ton of microphones, Carissa. What I would say is go look up just type in best mics for voice acting, read about five different articles. And the ones that all of the articles list, those are good. I personally have a Rode NT1A and I have a Neumann TLM 102. All right, let's see. Um, so that's what you should get back is these files. All right, so things to avoid for your presentation is incorrect estimation of the lines uh, when you come in because that's gonna affect recording time. You need to know about how many lines you have. Okay. So um, also you don't want to be rushed for reasons I just explained, right? Uh, you don't want your actors to be rushed, your director to be rushed. Uh, you want to get, uh, you know, be on top of things and ready uh, because everything gets, you know, pressured and messed up when it's crunched. So try not to crunch. I mean, sometimes life happens and things are crunched, right? But uh, 
do what you can. Disorganization. So if you do work with professionals, right, you bring in a studio like my company or whatever, and uh, they, they're going to organize everything. They're going to have a plan, this step, this step, this step, this step, and then you get your files, you know, and so uh, other, otherwise, you know, it could be uh, pretty disorganized. And never send an unfinished script, right? I actually had, oh God, what was it? Oh, I know when I did the Sega game, actually I got the final copy of the, the script because they were still doing updates. I got it at 3 a.m. Uh, the next day. So uh, my microphones, by the way, the question, uh, I have a Rode NT1A and a Neumann TLM 102. And, uh, and a lot of people use the Shure SMB7, I think that's what it is. A lot of people use that too. Again, just search those uh, best voiceover microphones and take the ones that are in all the articles. <laughs> that's the ones you want. Okay, so these things you want to avoid uh, for your thing. I'm gonna to try to wrap up here and then get to the other questions. All right, this is really, really, really important, right? Budgeting, um, it can very widely vary, uh, but uh, if you hire a whole studio and you've got a director an engineer and high quality recording and all everything, it's gonna cost around 15 up to 50 a line. Uh, or you could say, if you have an hour of animation, so 10,000 to 25,000. Um, actually, since I moved my company to North Carolina, uh, costs are much lower here. So I can do it less than, <laughs> I can do it for less than 10,000, but there's so many costs, right? You've got the initial, uh, you've got casting time, uh, you've got directing, you've got uh, an engineer, right? Then you've got the actors you gotta pay for, then you've got post-production, Right, so all of that stuff, uh, you know, goes into it, right? So, and of course, you know, people need to get paid for their hard work, uh, but you get all the stuff. Plus you'll get, you know, the uh, file organization, you'll get the professional uh, service and communication, right? All those things if you hire somebody who's, who's a, like a studio, right? Even the small studio or whatever that's capable uh, for that kind of thing. And, and so, uh, you know, and I happily will give people estimates for free. So if you do have like a, a excuse me, if you do have a, a project or whatever uh, that you just want to have an idea how much it might cost, you know, I can uh, you know, get you an estimate uh, on, and just give you an idea if you want. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see. So one thing that's, that's rough is just going out there on the internet on your own, like voice123 or voices.com. Uh, you can, who knows what you're going to get, right? Uh, it's random. Uh, you can listen to their demos and stuff like that, but um, they have different mics. It's not going to be studio matching. There's not normalization, right? It could be good. It could be not. People can be flaky on these things. They can disappear. Uh, they can deliver you something horrible, uh, you know, and then of course people are rushing to, to get the lowest. Oh, I can get it for super cheap. Yeah. And it's still, you get what you pay for a type of situation. Definitely. Okay. So um, there's a few, by the way, oh my gosh, I got a lot of questions here. Let's see. Um, there's a few, um, um, what was I going to say? Nope, I forgot it. All right, I'm going to go on because I'm trying to fit all this in in a couple of minutes. I see I've got a bunch of talent, uh, questions. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, voices.com, highly unethical. I mean, sort of, I don't know if it's unethical, but we kind of look down on them sort of like, eh, these people are just low bidding and, and you know, taking work from people who should get paid more, sure. But if you're, I'm, I've been on both sides. I, I produced a film, right? You know, so it's like I've produced and acted. So I know, you know, like you don't have money to make something. You don't have money, you know, so you got to do the best you can. Uh, well, there might be, yeah. I mean, there's, that's why I said don't use those places because they could flake or scam you or stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, use people that are actually trustworthy. Union talent usually costs double what the going rate is. Uh, but if you want a named actor, you're usually gonna have to go in union and that, that flips the whole project union and you have to pay everybody union rates, okay? Uh, but most indie stuff is not union. All right, um, anywhere, yeah, I got a lot of questions. All right, good, I might have some time to answer some questions here at the end, all right. Let's see, uh, so um, the summary, basically things you should do, use experienced studio and director. Uh, also, I'm gonna throw in there, make sure you have a writer look at your script uh, before. Uh, I don't know about casting call club, by the way, I haven't used that. Uh, but let's see. Uh, so have a writer look over your script and make sure your characters sound different from each other, right? In terms of their lines, their words that they use. Uh, if you do have a studio, you get the benefits of organization, uh, consistent delivery, uh, no flakiness, uh, professionalism. They're not going to go and tell everybody they're working on your project, right? Uh, they'll have a talent pool. Like here in North Carolina, I have over 50 actors in my talent pool already, right? And so, uh, you know, I've got a lot of people to, to go straight to and I know who they are. 
Uh, you want to know what you need before you go to get your voiceover done uh, and know what you should get in return, right? So that list I gave you of all those things in return, uh, you, you can have an idea of your budget. So if you, uh, and like I said, I gave you those kind of numbers earlier for how much your animation is going to cost. So, uh, you know, know that ahead of time so you can hire your voice actors. And of course, avoid all of those bad things. All right, let's see if I can drop in and uh, answer these Q and A. Okay, I did answer that one. Okay, big push for people of color to voice characters are also people of color, yes. Uh, voice artists have had to drop out of productions in favor of POC to fulfill a role. What do I think about this new push? I think, uh, first of all, the whoever you know is making an animation, they get to decide who they want to cast. If that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's kind of what I think about that, right? It's their animation, right? So if they want to cast uh, people of color as people of color, I mean, it's 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 good in the sense that uh, it's hard, you know. It's already hard to, to find roles if you have a specific type of voice. So if they're looking for your type of voice, it's so much better for you. So I think it's fair in many ways uh, that, that that's happening. But I also think that people can do whatever they want. It's their money and their animation, right? So if they want to do it, then they do it. If they don't want to do it, they should be free to not do it as well, right? And so that's how that is. All right, so let's see. Uh, what do I got? Like how many minutes? Two minutes? Three minutes? Four minutes. Okay. Okay. Let's see, answered that. Dips on working in different voices. Uh, yes, uh, working tips on working in different voices. Take my voiceover class, right? I can't, I can't really tell you all that right now, how to change the different voices. But um, there, usually you've, you're going to have a pitch range that's only so far, right? And so um, you, you're not going to be able to go outside of that. And so you got to find your highest and your lowest. And that's part of what I teach in the voiceover class is finding your lowest and your highest and then working in between. So that's one of the very first things that I do with you in the voiceover class that I do. In fact, I do this class through CTN. So uh, we should be having uh, another online class soon through that, but there's a whole bunch of stuff there. All right, so let's see, I'm gonna say that I answered that one. You and this tip can be messy. How difficult is it to have a production with both union and non-union actors together? It's not difficult, it's impossible. You don't do it. Your project is either union or it is non-union, right? Uh, that's how that works, <laughs> all right? So let's see. Um, uh, what first steps would you advise to take to a person wanting to begin pursuing voice acting? Probably talk to some people in the industry because usually I tell people right now is a terrible time to get in uh, because uh, so much recording is done from home. People are going out and they're buying mics and setting up a home studio and proclaiming themselves a voice actor and the industry is flooded with people. And so it's hard to get noticed uh, beyond that but you need to be skilled and you need to work on getting toward a voice demo, which is really the gateway, uh, which was what I do in class two for CTN. I teach how to get a demo. So first, there's a whole bunch of skills you need to learn first, including lingo and all that kind of stuff. But really, uh, it's, it's very difficult. It's like being anything else, any kind of entertainment actor or something like that. It's very, very hard to get into. Uh, and it's a tough time to try to get in right now. But if you really wanna do it, again, talk to some other voiceover people and see what they say. Do professional studios deliver with the S's and the plosive worked out? Or is that still up to whoever is comping the sound in the end? I'm not sure what you mean by worked out <laughs> in this. Uh, really, it's, it's usually up to the director and engineer to catch those. Uh, usually we'll look for that because the engineer, if you, you're in a pro studio, the engineer's watching that waveform. And so they'll see it. I, I love it. You know, I, I worked at um, my friend's studio, Central Command Studios in North Hollywood. And that engineer there, Jeff, is amazing. He catches everything, right? He, you know, he's like, oh, I think there was a truck outside or, you know, whatever, or airplane or, you know, sometimes that, but he, they, we usually catch it in the studio. Uh, so I've almost, I've never had to uh, do that because between the mic and the actor distance and all the other things we do, we don't have a problem with that usually and, and we'll catch it when it does. So there we go. All right, and then what happens when you cast a kid for a show, but the show goes in a long time, the kid's voice changes, they stay on a real recast. I've never worked on a show long enough for a child to grow up in. So, and I doubt very few people have, so I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to just tell you that. I have no idea what they do there. That is a very unusual situation. Um, so uh, let's see. All right, so I'm looking in the chat because if there's anything else. So will this be on YouTube? I think it, it's on YouTube live right now. So you should be able to go back and look at it. Uh, and so there you go. Um, let's see. So that's me once again. I'm Stephen Weiss. 
Uh, my company is Marvelous Spiral Theater. We produce voices for animation and video games. And so hopefully you learned stuff about how to do animation uh, voiceover. And uh, I'm on LinkedIn, right? So if you wanna find me on LinkedIn, it's just Steven Weiss, uh, like it says, uh, if you wanna connect uh, professionally. And uh, I'm happy to help you uh, answer, you know, other maybe simple questions of the future and stuff like that. And also, and I am teaching through CTN, so check their CTN events page uh, from time to time and you will uh, be able to see when I'm teaching the next voiceover class if you want that. Okay, you are welcome. And I am glad that you learned stuff. So uh, we'll see you around maybe somewhere on the internet. All right, all right. You're welcome. <laughs>